Could everyone hear me earlier? Yep, I heard you, Shannon. Okay, sorry about that. Um, just get the, the recording set up there. So I'll be moderating today's call with Stacy Burnett, my colleague in South Dakota, and this is the second of three webinars throughout the summer. So today's webinar is called Team-Based Flu Fit IFOB Implementation. And we can go to the next slide. So this webinar is presented by the American Cancer Society in partnership with Great Plains Quality Innovation Network, the South Dakota Department of Health, Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Health Board, the South Dakota Comprehensive Cancer Control Program, the Community Health Care Association of the Dakotas, North Dakota Department of Health. Line muted. Their partnership. So lots of great partners involved in this. And as a reminder, feel free to add your questions the chat box anytime during the presentation today. Our speakers will do their best to address questions throughout the presentation, and we'll also have some time at the end of the call for some Q&A. So just a quick review of our agenda today. We're going to start out with a field example um, from a clinic that has implemented it successfully, and then we have a presentation um, on team-based care from Hilton, and as I said, Okay, next slide. Um, just a quick review of our learning objectives today. And one thing I just want to mention real quick is um, as folks are thinking about a flu fit um, program, I think in the first webinar, for those of you there, you know, our speakers that this could be an event, or this also could be something integrated into regular office visits, or sometimes it can be both. So really something that we want to um, be something you can customize to work for your organization. So our learning objectives today are to describe the role of the flu fit champion, to coordinate efforts, to discuss the importance of involving clinic team members in the planning process, identify team member roles, and then understand some of the key elements of staff training. Do you have any issues? Why? Oh. Um, so at this time, I'd like to introduce Christina Morin from Quentin Burdick Healthcare Facility in North Dakota. Christina is a public health nurse RN, and she's going to share an example of her experience with FluFit. So go ahead, Christina. Hello, everyone. Um, like she said, my name is Christina Morin. I'm from the Quinton and Burdick Memorial Healthcare Facility located in Belcourt, North Dakota. Our facility serves the Turtle Mountain Indian Reservation, um, which approximately has about 25,000 enrolled mem members, give or take. So um, I'll kind of just jump into it. Um, our public health nursing department played a key role in helping our facility meet our GIPRA numbers for colorectal cancer screening. And part of meeting that, we did the flu fit clinic in our community. We worked together as a group. Um, there was no specific person who took the lead. Um, we all just worked together and communicated um, which events we were going to do. Um, the planning process involved planning to go to areas that were of highest population in our community where we felt that we would hit the age groups, especially for flu fit. Um, we went to places such as the Skydancer Casino, um, we have a mall in our in Belcourt where the post office is located that gets a large amount of um, patient flow, I guess you could say. Um, we did tribal health fairs in the community, tribal election booths, um, and we also had the tribal or the Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Board from South Dakota come to our facility in March to do the rolling colon, which we educated patients there, did the flu fit clinics um, because it was right in the clinic area where we did the rolling colon. So the flu shots can be given there, and then we did the um, FOBT kits there. Um, we planned out as a group where each nurse would be holding the flu fit clinics and then and who would be doing what. So for the most part, we had two nurses going out to the events. Um, 
we also have what's uh, a tribal health team on our reservation, which consists of two workers. Their names are Donna and Jolene. So they accompanied us to the majority of the events and helped us to screen and get patients to come to the, our flu fit booth. Um, so with that, one nurse helped the tribal health workers explain the colorectal cancer part, and then we had one nurse doing the flu shot. Um, and so like one big thing that we had with our flu fit clinics was um, our tribal health um, department. It is located right by our office. They had a tribal health grant that they received to where we could give out $25 visa gift, gift cards to the patients who were screened and um, got the FOBT kit. And so if they got the kit, um, there was a piece of paper they had in the kit that we had to sign when they got the kit, and then they would have to bring the kit into our lab, and once it was given, then the lab um, worker would sign it, and they would have to bring the paper back to Tribal Health, and then they got a $25 gift card. So um, we've been doing that for about two years that I know of. So this year was the first year that I've really been involved with the FluFit Clinic. Um, so I did notice a large amount of patients did bring the kits back with having that gift card. Um, let me see. And for the most part, when we did, we kept the name, the names and everybody of who would um, get the kits and stuff, and we would do follow up with them to see um, our rate as to like who returned the kits, who didn't return the kits, and then the people that didn't return the kits. We, gave, we did instruct them they had two weeks to bring them back, and if they didn't, then we did call reminders to let them know to bring the kits in. Um, uh, training for the flu fit clinics, um, our facility has been doing the FOBT um, kits for, year, for, quite a few, for a few years, I guess you could say. So before the flu fit came along, we did go out into the community. So this was something new for us that we offered the flu shots along with the um, colorectal cancer screening. And I thought it went pretty well. Um, we, the training for the flu fit clinics, we received a lot of emails um, from IHS and from the tribal chairman's board that taught us what to do and how to do things. I think that's about it, if you have any questions. Thank you, Christina. We thought this was such a great example for this webinar because you worked as such a team collaborating with you know, a variety of different roles that were involved there. So thank you for sharing your, your story. It's great to hear those field examples for some tangible tips and examples. I'll introduce our featured speaker today, uh, Kate Hilton who is a senior faculty with Rethink Health. With her ex uh, expertise in community engagement, Kate helps teach people how to build will and lead change in community health and quality improvement settings. She serves as senior faculty on Rethink Health's leadership and organizing for action. It is a five-year engagement with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to develop leadership and organizing skills among quality improvement leaders. Kate previously led Rethink Health's place-based Healthy Columbia project to demonstrate the contributions organizing can make to the transformation of health. Kate also works with Institute for Healthcare Improvement, leading online training programs and coaching leaders of healthcare systems and communities across the world. Kate earned a JD from University of Wisconsin, an MTS from Harvard Divinity School, and an AB from Dartmouth College. We are really happy to have you here today, Kate, and you can go ahead and start your presentation. Okay, thanks. I appreciate the introduction. I think the only thing you may have missed is that I love to have fun and dance, so I hope to keep everyone relatively entertained without, uh, without showing you my moves, although who knows what could happen on this call. Um, it's really a pleasure to be with everybody. So um, I wanted to first of all thank Stacey and Shannon for inviting me and for being connected to the American Cancer Society through many different partners. Um, Tamara Robinson uh, participated in the Quality Improvement Network, a National Coordinating Center 
course, Leadership and Organizing uh, in Action, uh, as part of uh, one of the community partners of the Great Plains Quinn. And I'm so pleased to see so many alumni on this call, including Jennifer Geyser, Denise Kolba, James Stotts, and others. So I just want to really raise up the, the, the collective genius within this group already around how to do teamwork and how to put these conditions in place. And so many great coaches already within this, this learning community around this. Um, they could easily be teaching and training you in this as I, because I know now that they are, they are fully, um, they're fully equipped. So, um, so please lean into, into those colleagues. I also want to thank Christina for sharing her example with us. Uh, it was, it's really helpful and we're going to keep calling back on it, Christina, as we, as we talk a little bit about what we can put into place to create effective teams, um, and particularly the teams that you want to create in addition to some of the conditions we can all put into place. We want to be sure that we're meeting our learning objectives around describing the role of the, the FluFit IFOB champions, um, discussing important, importance of involving uh, clinic team members in the planning process, identifying the role, and understanding key elements to the staff training. So I'll also be inviting Stacy and Shannon and Christina to chime in as we get to those various objectives. Um, I wanted to start by asking folks just to go ahead and chat in and just take a second to think of a dream team that you've been a part of and a scream team. We're going to start with the, uh, the, the screen team, actually. Um, I want to invite you to reflect on what made it so. What, what makes the experience with being a part of the, uh, the screen team so painful? And everyone, uh, when you go into the chat box, there's this scroll down box where you can send your comment to everyone versus just the host. So it might be fun right now if you select everyone so we can see different responses. Okay, Jennifer is chatting in. Lack of an organized leader. What else folks? Thanks, Jennifer. And thanks, Jane and Jennifer, to all my alums, so I know they're here to <laughs> Back me up here. Lack of participation. Everyone falls on one person. Great. Thanks, Patricia. Team members not prepared. No teamwork. Okay. Lack of enthusiasm, effort, poor participation. Exactly. So folks are identifying, you know, there's no one really guiding the team. There's no collective facilitation or even, you know, distributed leadership of participation. Um, roles aren't clear. Vision isn't clear. Unclear purpose, unclear plan. Well, this is great. You guys are you're getting right to the point of what we're going to get into today around what we can put into place to create the dream team. So on the flip side, let's just think about what what has made being a part of a team really effective and and meaningful. What happens when you're on the dream dream team? What is created by that team? What are they doing? Okay, we're going to have you think about your experience on a dream team. Hopefully, we've had a few experiences throughout our entire lives <laughs> with teams. Good. Okay, so we're getting everyone participating, contributing. There's like a collective effervescence. The team is getting smarter by everyone's participation. People are communicating effectively. We're drawing on people's strengths, taking over when someone's weak with somebody else who could maybe um, build on their own assets to, to play that role, so having to find roles. Active participation, fun. Okay, thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, I mean, fun should certainly be something we aspire to as a team. Uh, keeps the team motivated, certainly. Um, clear vision, exactly. People understanding roles. Okay, good. Okay, good. You guys are you're stealing all my thunder. This is exactly what I wanted. So, um, this, these are the types of conditions we're going to want to put into place on our teams, and we're going to actually look at some evidence-based conditions that we can put on our on in place on our teams today. So. First, let's just do sort of the high level, um, 30,000 foot, the criteria we're, we're striving for with our, with our work um, and with the work of these effective leadership teams. So the first is that the team achieves outcomes. So, you know, with Fluefit, that they're achieving real outcomes, that you're, you've set an aim, you're, you're meeting that aim through the work of the team, you're getting X number of, um, of folks, you know, that go through the program, et cetera, X number of sites and events, 
whatever aims you set for yourself around uh, around that. And then building the capacity is the second aim. So how you as a team are building capacity, not only for, for becoming smarter and better and more capable over time in, with Fluid, but also with regard to um, future efforts. So once that team has capacity, what else can you do with that team, right? How else do you work together to achieve various other outcomes in the world and, and build on the capacity you're building around Fluid? And then the other is um, the individual growth. So folks developing as leaders and as stewards as a consequence of working together. So these are the criteria that we're aspiring towards. It's not just the aim achieved. We have to pay exquisite attention, again, to the people and the way in which they're, they're motivated to, to achieve that outcome with regard to how they work together. And so we can fortunately draw on uh, uh, some various different leadership models that we, we may or may not have played uh, a part of experiencing before. So one is hierarchy, um, where we are a part of a system that is very, um, it's clear who has authority, who's making decisions, but maybe one, one you know, area isn't speaking to the other. Um, another model would be where there's what we call um, the dot in the center or the lone wolf, where everyone is, but that person sort of holds everything together. We've been a, a part of teams where we can't even reach that person because they're holding so much. Uh, they, you know, it's, it's hard to even reach them, and they're not sharing or distributing uh, roles or power or uh, opportunities, tasks with other people to grow and to and to achieve the outcomes. And of course, there's no sustainability here. This person will eventually collapse from from the the weight of that. Um, and then, with regard to the the third that you see here is this idea where we talk about in the scream team where we have, you know, a lot of people think they're on a team, there's no real team there. They're all, um, there's no shared purpose, they're all sort of trying to achieve this theoretical aim, you know, in their own way, but not actually collaborating or participating together. So what we're striving for in really building uh, a distributed leadership model is one in which you have a team at the, at the core that is working together, and you'll see here the arrows are bi-directional. People are on the team, all in relationship to one another. They're committed not only to the aim, but they're committed to the responsibility to their relationships within the team and to one another on the team, and they're committed to why it matters and how they can um, really learn and grow uh, and, 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 again, affect change as a result of working together. So, so we're wanting to put in place the conditions that enables those teams to work together effectively and, and potentially build teams of teams across our state or states um, to you know, achieve the aims of this program. So uh, you know, a few advantages with regard to distributed leadership include breaking down our big goal into achievable chunks if we have more than one team at play, which is this learning community, having many teams, and having each team um, then work together around an equal status contract between the different stakeholders. I love, Christina, your example of having these two nurses and these tribal health workers. and there was an equal status contract uh, that was built in the way in which they went around um, to, to execute their work in taking on different roles to achieve the outcome. And so the idea is that each team member is playing this necessary interdependent role. You know, the tribal health workers having the relationships in the field, um, understanding the people, the place, contextualizing, um, and the nurses, uh, you know, having a various, uh, taking on various expertise around colorectal um, cancer and around the flu shots. Uh, and then, of course, we want to engage people at all levels. So we want to invite people onto our team so we can build this work out and build that 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 image of the snowflake across other teams in our organizations or in in our territories um, that can that, that can replicate uh, this work and build uh, the outcomes we're striving for. So the good news is that we can actually put in place conditions that um, will enable teams to work together more effectively. So we're going to both um, Think about our teams in this context and how we as leaders are helping enable others to put these conditions in place as they begin working together. And this research comes from our colleagues, Ruth Wagman and um, Richard Hackman. Uh, Richard Hackman uh, recently passed away, but they're organizational psychologists out of Harvard University that um, dedicated their, their academic life to understanding what makes teams work effectively. I'm going to um, respond here to Ty very quickly. There you go, Ty. Um, to go back to that slide. You're very welcome. And um, so 
the three conditions we're going to put into place, uh, one is a real team with the right people. The second is a compelling shared purpose, which you guys have named as being something that's essential. And the third is an enabling structure where we have clear roles, clear norms, how we're going to work together, uh, and real teamwork. So let's take them in one by one. The first is the real team with the right people. So there are three conditions that we're looking to put into place when we establish a real team. The first is that it's founded. So we, we, leaders will know who's on the team and who isn't. In fact, everyone will know who's on the team and who isn't. And, um, and you should be able to name who's on it. So it's not people coming and going or who shows up or who doesn't. It's not just like you have an automatic right to participate because you, you came. Um, you know who's in, you know who's out. And usually effective teams have, can anyone guess the, mo the number of the most effective teams? Try me in the chat. What do you think the most, the number for the most effective team, the number of team members? Okay, Ty's getting three, Patricia seven, up to five. Okay, does anyone, let's think about this. Why would you put those numbers in there? What makes that number the right number for an effective team, or those numbers? Let's chat it then. Worth thinking about. <laughs> I like uneven ties getting at decision making. I think that that can be important. Sometimes less is more. Small groups tiebreaker. Okay, so um, these are all uh, relevant answers, and I would say yes to all of them. And uh, it's really because the size relies on everyone on the team to participate. So you guys said early on, like dream teams, everyone's participating. Well, for everyone to actually feel responsible for the success of the team, you really don't want to have more than seven members. So you guys were pretty much in the range. Usually four to seven is the sweet spot for teams because if you have more than seven, people start to feel like, well, if I don't show up, it doesn't matter because everyone else can take it over. Um, people actually feel really responsible when you're at the number between four and seven. And it's worth noting if you're in an organization where you have a team that may be larger than that, you may want to think about how can we break up our work and create sort of teams of teams um, and build sort of that snowflake structure that we looked at in the first place around taking different pieces of this on or um, like multiplying teams with the same function across, you know, five and five doing the same thing but taking in different territories, for example. Um, and the reason for that, again, is really to equip everyone to participate and feel responsible. Um, so again, bounded being the first condition. The second is uh, that the team meets regularly and its membership is, con is constant. So here, what we're, what we're talking about with stability is that it's not a different random group of people every time, and even though the membership of the team will likely evolve over time, it's going to remain constant long enough that the team learns to work together. Um, it, can, it can build its capacity to, to be more capable as a group of people over time, really each, each team member um, supporting sort of the growth and development of how they, how they function as a team and, um, and, co and committing consistent time and effort to it. So stability is the second condition we can put into place. A third is interdependency. Uh, so here we're talking about the contribution that each person making as being critical to the whole. And uh, team members have to work together closely exchange information and assets in order to get the work done. So here the idea is, um, uh, you know, taking on, as we've discussed already, some of the roles that would enable folks to, 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 act, to work together interdependently. Um, so teams that are bounded, stable, and interdependent um, make up a real team. They hold their members to account to one another and to function and participate effectively. The second part of the real team piece, though, isn't just uh, how the team functions, it's also who's on it. Um, oops, there we go, sorry, every team member is critical to success. Um, who's on it? So we also want to think about our membership and the people. So obviously, you know, you want folks with various skills um, with regard to, and I'm just going to flip it first to um, diversity, so strong and weak ties, um, people that have, in your case, you know, various nurses that could explain colorectal cancer or conduct flu shots or people with relationship to the people in the field that you're engaging in the work. Um, so, but, but you're also looking for folks who can function on a team, uh, who, who have time, who have, as you guys described, passion, 
like really believe this matters and get get a tremendous amount of satisfaction out of it. Um, folks who are willing to go into the field as you, you by necessity are in this work and deal with the uncertainty or the surprises, the constraints and opportunities that you come up against um, as you go to various sites, uh, you want to, you know, be working with folks who are working effectively with one another, building consensus, doing learning through sort of PDSA learning and action uh, improvement in the work. So again, you know, we think when we're recruiting people to our teams, we are definitely thinking about do they have these characteristics in addition to the simple skills that I need? What kind of team member will they be? Um, and here, uh, I think we can take a pause here around uh, exploring sort of the flu fit champions and what they bring to our team. Uh, I wanted to first invite uh, Shannon and Stacy uh, to, to walk us through this. And, and then Christine, I wanted to reflect with you a little bit about that in the context of the work you've done. Sure, this is Shannon. So some of the characteristics, um, and this comes from flufit.org, that when you think about a champion, that this could be a variety of different um, clinical roles within the organization. But this is, this is an enthusiastic physician, nurse, team leader, or QI manager. And maybe you haven't used the term champion in the past, but when you kind of think about your organization, you probably have a few first um, thoughts about who this would be when you think about who is that person that just has a knack for really motivating the team um, and really getting buy-in across departments. Um, and maybe it's a couple of people where you have your motivator and you have that person who's really good at the logistics and coordinating all of those details. So this can look differently um, depending on the organization. A um, couple of points from bluefit.org. Um, to think about people who have the time and the skills to kind of oversee the staff who will carry out the day-to-day -day activities of the program um, and who are, have that ability to involve the entire team in the planning process and help clarify roles. Great. Thank you so much. And Christina, um, could you reflect with us in terms of uh, identifying champions on your team? It sounded to me like you had a lot of very equal participation on your team as you presented. I wondered if you could explore with us this idea. Did you have multiple champions on your team? How did it work? Um, yeah, we did. Pretty much um, our supervisor plays a huge part in letting us know like what events we should try to be doing. So um, each month we have a calendar that comes out that we give her um, activities and stuff that we're going to be doing. So like it, all this stuff is planned like a month ahead of time, and then she puts it on the calendar as to what, you know, what we're going to be doing. So we all just kind of talk with each other about, okay, where are we going to go? What are we going to do at this sort of function? Because we do get a lot of stuff going on in our community that we try to go to. Great. Okay, good. So you you did have a supervisor sort of overseeing, you know, the the space to make it happen, and then you you brought on enthusiastic people who really were committed to, to working together around this. Uh, and in many ways, different people play different roles of championing, it sounds like. And actually, sometimes it can happen that uh, champions sort of shift and change and evolve over time. You can have one person who who is the skeptic, who, be, who has a transformational experience and becomes your champion. So this, you know, while we're looking to identify and recruit, um, champions as part of like who the right people to be a part of our team are, just also to note that, um, uh, you know, we can also build champions. Okay, great. So, um, thank you. So the second piece around, as I mentioned earlier, um, recruiting the right people is to think about sort of our strong and weak ties across the community. And Christine, I think your example is beautiful with regard to your team partnering with tribal health workers. Um, you had strong ties within your network, the nurses that were working together, and then weaker ties, people outside of your immediate network who partnered with you together to, to, to advance the work. Um, it's a really great example of, of what we're inviting folks to be thinking about as they, they build out teams that bring various resources, um, backgrounds, ideas, uh, context, relationships, networks to the work. And they can also help us think differently about the learning, how to make it better in different locations with different types of um, groups or targeted populations. Uh, so, so thinking a lot about that um, as we recruit various folks. Um, 
and I want to turn it back to, to Stacy and Shannon uh, to speak a little bit about the clinic team members with regard to who to identify to recruit. Yeah, I think just to reiterate, you know, um, what Kate has been sharing, that it really is about the whole team. It's a team effort, and it's not just a couple of leaders kind of coming up with the plan. So where we've seen it be really successful is where there is a diverse group from the team involved in the planning process. Every different role involved is going to have that insight into their, you know, day-to-day -day activities and how this is going to fit into their work um, or to a flu fit event. So definitely recommend engaging the whole team and getting that input from the beginning um, and, you know, giving yourself a couple of months to plan this and just think through any details. Um, and there's a note here, too, that the, the team members can include medical assistants, other healthcare workers, um, and those who are, you know, willing to be trained to provide the flu shots and, and fit kits to the patient. Awesome. Great. Thank you. And folks, if you do have questions about any of this as we go, you know, feel free to chat it in. We can either um, invite Shannon or Christina or Stacey to re respond directly in the chat or we can raise it up for the group because we will be having Q&A at the end, um, but we certainly can also just roll it into what we're doing if it's relevant to a particular subject. So, great. Thanks, you guys. Um, so to, to kind of recap here then, a real team with the right people means that we have a, we put the conditions in place to establish that real team that's bounded, stable, and interdependent. And we've got the right people who are collaborative and who are diverse with regard to, you know, either what internally within our clinical teams and then externally as we uh, partner with others in moving it out to various target populations. Okay, so ask yourself, do you have those things in place? And ask yourself, what could I do to put those things in place? How could, how can my team together, even better, put that, put that into place together and maybe even surface some conversation around being bounded, stable, and interdependent with a couple of the core leaders or champions um, and, and how, to get, how to get there. And we're going to talk more about how to get there in the enabling structure, but um, just, just to surface some of this um, within your team. So the next condition we're going to look at is the compelling purpose. And here uh, we're looking for three, uh, three criteria. So leadership teams have a shared purpose that is clear, challenging, and consequential. And clear uh, means that we're articulating what the, the outcomes of the team's work will look like if they're achieved. So this is sort of the, you know, the aim. It states what the team is created to do. It, it states also who is doing it and what kinds of activities the team members are going to be participating in in order to achieve that aim. So it's really understanding sort of the, the, the who, what, how uh, with a really clear uh, statement of purpose. The second is that that statement is challenging. So it's taking the best of what people are capable of, a real stretch, but not impossible if everybody really strives. And the idea there is if you think you can achieve 10, then multiply it by 5 and move the aim to 50, sort of, you know, standard QI practice when, when aim setting. You want it to be challenging, aspirational, something you're going to have to work hard to achieve. Uh, Amazingly, the psychology of AIMS is that that really helps drive people, um, both to be motivated and committed, but also just simply to get into action and to not, um, you know, thinking, oh, it's not as important or it doesn't matter as much. Um, and then finally, the consequential purpose is that it will have a real impact on the lives of others. This is the why. You know, that there's, it's rooted in values that we know why it will matter. It's going to save lives. And it's going to keep people healthy. It's going to keep people in work. It's going to keep them with their families. It's going to keep kids in school. Uh, whatever it is, it's articulating that both in terms of story uh, and sharing that aspiration in the purpose and establishing that purpose with the team, but also sharing the stories around that, around why it matters to you, around why it matters to other team members, so that you're, you're brought together around that shared purpose and you, in fact, um, you're motivated to be a part of the team of people that care about this. That's who you are together. That's what this team represents. And, you know, that, from that type of meaning and purpose, we derive uh, a tremendous amount of joy. Um, so that brings us back to also having a little fun. So, okay. So, you know, I just would just note a couple things about um, why it is so important to develop that shared purpose. You guys named that a lot of teams that are dysfunctional don't do it. So there's a reason why we do it. And the first is that, um, 
leaders come to teams with, first of all, different amounts of power and assets, different resources. And so a shared purpose suggests that all the partners are equal by defining the activity space of the group, not just any one individual. It's not their team, it's the team's team. So truly together developing the shared purpose and not having it imposed on you uh, makes a big difference in the psychology of the team and how it functions together. Uh, it, also, the purpose itself establishes the scope of activity around which uh, the team members can cohere. It points them interdependently in the same direction. And it also, um, it, it, there's like an added benefit to establishing a shared purpose, which is that pre-existing negative patterns in intergroup relations can be overcome when we have mutually valued, like, superordinate purposes, that it's like bigger than just our small, you know, hidden agendas. If we really keep purpose front and center and we reinforce that purpose over and over, it can get us out of some of the like agenda pushing things that I think some of us experience sometimes on the screen team. So purposes are really important for that. The second thing is that it can be a struggle to keep uh, team members engaged sometimes in our work. And so obviously this could be for food, but this could be for other things you're working on too. Um, balancing especially volunteer commitments against like full-time employment so if you're engaging others in the community in various ways and working on this with you, um, a shared purpose co-created with them is important because it enables, um, especially when participation isn't financially compensated or directly related to like your, your professional requirements, uh, it's a way to generate commitment. It's, it's getting collectively everyone to buy in and own the team together. So that's why we do it. And so I want you to reflect, you know, on your team, uh, whether you have a clear, challenging, and consequential purpose. And, um, you know, if you haven't yet established a team, we can look at some ways in which you might actually establish that together and create a, a little time at the, at the launch of your team to get clear and co-own its purpose together. Okay, so reflect on that. And then the third condition that we want to put into place is around an enabling structure. So here, what we're going to be looking at is whether there are interdependent roles, real teamwork, and norms of conduct. So first, let's look at interdependent roles, which you all named as being really important uh, to a dream team. There's not just um, people going off in their own directions or one person taking on all of the work of the team, but it's that there's real participation and there's clarity around who's doing what and how it all fits together. So one of the things we need to do to figure out who's going to play what roles, and again, some of you may already have ideas like, well, she's a nurse who's very, very skilled at delivering flu shots, or he's a nurse who's very, very skilled at describing colorectal cancer to, to folks. Um, you know, and prevention and its importance to folks and what to do, um, well then, you know, those are certainly skills and resources. But there may be other things. So-and-so is from this community and has a network of, um, you know, of folks in the target population. Or so-and-so um, speaks a certain language and we're going into a community where that language is spoken. Um, or so-and-so is the decision maker. Or so-and-so brings along you know, everyone in their church or whatever it is, right? So there's, there is a, um, this identification of who your people are on your team, what they bring to your team, and actually spending a little time with each other to see each other's assets and skills um, as you de determine what roles you should play. Sometimes it's really obvious, but it isn't always, and there may be things that you wish you could bring to the team or others do that are hidden. Um, and so part of that is inviting that to be named and made explicit. Um, we would never want, for example, a surgical team to ask this question with a patient on the table, obviously, but, um, but the idea here is that we, you know, it's re it really is important if, if you know, the, out if the patient outcome in this case is, is the aim, uh, positive pa patient outcome, then really being clear about who's doing what and, and how the team functions effectively together in various roles is critical. So there are lots of different types of roles. Um, and, and of course, we want sort of a roughly equal share of work based on people's unique skills and resources, understanding that, again, each skill, each role is going to be necessary for us to achieve the team's purpose. 
Um, and the reason that's so important when you guys talked about it as, as either part of being a dream team or a screen time team is that the way that it enables success or failures of one will have effect on the whole. And that is what in part makes it a team. And a failure isn't a bad thing, but the team is there to help fail forward. The team is there to support and nurture and learn and create um, a more capable uh, team and, and, and taking accountability, shared responsibility together for that outcome, um, and actually learning through the failures. So I think, you know, the idea here is that um, it's not like, well, you know, in part it's for accountability, but it's, it's not so much accountability as it is um, learning and thinking about how we're enabling one another on the team to achieve our shared purpose, no matter what happens when we encounter the world. So, um, so again, we're, we're thinking about what people are well poised to do, and we want to be clear about the roles. Um, generic roles could be during a team meeting itself, like rotating roles, like note taker, et cetera coordinator, facilitator, um, these can rotate uh, or you might be very comfortable taking on different roles, you know, within, within a group. Um, but they could also be functional team roles. And here we're thinking about, you know, liaisons to different groups. Um, Christina's example is wonderful in that regard. Or, um, uh, you know, clarifying sort of the interdependencies between the members of the team so that the whole team is coordinated and aimed, uh, aimed in the same direction. All right, so Shannon and, Beck and uh, Stacey, would you please walk us through thinking about the, the team rooms for FluFit and IFOB? Yeah, so depending on different setups, um, you may have every team member carry out all aspects of giving out the flu shot and the fit kit to the patient, or you may decide to divide up those tasks, and you're probably going to have the best idea based on either flu clinics you've done in the past or what your kind of office visit flow looks like during flu shot season. Um, but one of the things to think about is the volume. So in high volume settings, you might need to assign uh, one or more extra people there um, so that they are able to help assess patient eligibility and then give out the fit kits. And in lower volume settings, it might be possible to, to create a good workflow for flu fit without adding any additional staffing. Um, and then I think there's one other slide on this, Kate. There is, yes. So, yeah, so once you have the details um, and you've kind of gotten input from everybody into the planning process and who will be involved, it's a really good idea to have a final staff training. Even if you've talked about it in team meetings in the past, a week or two, you know, before you kick off your flu fit, to bring everyone together and make sure you're all on the same page. Um, and there are some recommended pieces to that training that we'll talk about a little later. Um, and then also to think about assigning one person who kind of knows all the different aspects of how you're implementing flu fit, who can be on hand that day and be um, you know, available to help if there's logistical things that don't go quite as, quite as planned, um, they can kind of help develop a backup plan. Yeah, I love that. I love that, and of course you can play multiple roles. So you could be, you know, the person who's dedicated to doing the flu shots, but you're also the lunch break coverage person for the team on the whole, or whatever. And um, and that you, you know, you, you figure out ways for the team to function most effectively together in the, both in the training space and in the field. Um, okay, great. So thank you for covering this. I hope this is clear to folks. And again, if you're having any questions about this as we go, please go ahead and surface them in the chat. And Christina, you also named something really helpful here in the chat around uh, one of the nurses who did some flu fit clinics. Do you, do you want to articulate a little bit more about how roles worked on your team? I, I've made some attributions to you, but you, it may be better to hear from you directly. Um, yeah, so um, pretty much what I said was that one of the nurses, she was the head of our immunization program at our facility. So um, when we were figuring out who was going to do the um, fit part and who was going to do the flu shot part, she, for the most part, volunteered um, to do the flu shots just because she has years of experience with it. So she was very comfortable with doing that. And then the other nurse um, that also went out, that they worked a lot together to go out to the casino. So she had a lot of experience with doing the fit kits and stuff. Great. Thank you. Okay, so um, 
The second piece of enabling structures, so the first being roles, establishing clear roles in the context of these teams, and then the second is real teamwork. So here, I want to just really emphasize that paying super close attention to the strategic work that we actually do when we are together as a team is critical. Um, why is it so critical? Because we want to spend work actually doing teamwork when the te every time the team meets, not just reporting out, for example, because the way that the team develops its ability to work together increasingly well over time to learn each other's strengths and to keep each other energized is through doing teamwork, solving problems, making decisions, coordinating work. Um, yes, we obviously share information when we do that, but a meeting where people go in a circle and report out is a colossal waste of resource because A, reporting out can happen before a call, and B, uh, you should be you know, able to use those reports in the team meeting to do the other teamwork activity of consulting, coaching, solving problems, um, creating opportunities to support each other, making decisions about what you're going to do next, uh, learning, et cetera. So um, I just really want to underscore that because so many times we sit through meetings that we then turn into sort of these become our screen team meetings of just reporting out and sharing information but not actually functioning effectively as a team. And it, you stop really being a team when you're each individually doing work and not, in fact, working together. So just something to pay attention to, especially for those developing agendas and thinking about how to share both share facilitation of the team across the team, so the different people are taking on different parts of the meeting and owning different parts of the meeting itself as part of teamwork, as well as, um, in fact, how, you know, the exercise of the team works together. All right, the next is around norms of conduct. So the third enabling structure, you know, you could call these ground rules, you could call these uh, agreements, you could call this team culture. But the, we, we, we also call them norms of conduct, and they're, they, they are implicit. They are on every team if you do not name them. Um, we find that, uh, and, and through the, the research and the literature, that making them explicit is critical to high-functioning teams. Um, teams benefit, uh, you know, from rules about discussion, decision-making, and meeting management. And, again, you know, it, you can use the example of sort of like, well, we're going to meet on time and end on, we'll start on time and we'll end on time. Implicitly, if someone comes in five minutes late and the team waits for that person to arrive, then we have now set a new norm, which is, A, we don't take our agreements seriously. They don't really matter. B, um, now we are, uh, either that person holds a lot of power over everyone else or anybody could be like, you know, we're going to, um, we'll always just wait until everyone gets there. Um, so, in fact, wasting time, which is our team's probably our most precious resource, other than just the will of the people themselves, um, you know, has been wasted. And, and so, again, this is about taking the team seriously. It's having meaningful norms that will help guide the team's behavior. And generally teams um, that establish these types of norms uh, very explicitly and then revisit them and, and sort of start their meetings with, this is what we agreed to do, um, and end meetings with, how did we do today? Um, really help, not in a sort of like, you know, childish way, just simply in a, um, in a good management of, of a functioning team way, establish, you know, this is, this is who we are together. This is how we behave together. And this can be, instead of, I think a lot of people sort of shrink back from, from making this stuff explicit, but the more we make it explicit, the more we can actually um, function effectively together and kind of course correct as we go when we step outside the norm. Because it happens. It happens to everyone. And so also having an enforcement mechanism to hold one another accountable. Um, even if you're a good-intentioned, awesome team member, you can still come late, right? So uh, or you can still have your phone ring or you can still, um, you know, whatever it is. So um, this idea of having... It can be something fun, uh, a way in which to hold each other accountable. I'm on teams that um, I have to write a love bomb to everyone on the team when I'm late. I had to do it on uh, last Thursday, and I did it right during the team meeting. And, you know, of course, everybody felt good, but I was, like, working on my love bomb. You know, so there's um, 
there's uh, other other things like another team I'm on. We have to sing at the end of the meeting when we're late, and of course I don't mind that one so much. But um, as an extrovert, but uh, but it's really painful for some of the introverts. So the idea is, you know, these don't have to be uh, the types of enforcement mechanisms that um, are painful. They can be things that actually build team spirit and that can um, can help a team sort of create culture and identity, but just simply allows the team to acknowledge how it works together. So just something something to keep in mind on different types of norms. And again, you know, you see examples here on this slide of, of you know, discussion norms like respectful listening and candor, meeting management, et cetera. Um, so I won't, I won't repeat them, but you get the idea. So we, we've really seen that teams with explicit operating norms like this have a much higher likelihood of achieving the results that they're aiming for. So this isn't, you know, lean into, lean into the evidence. You can tell people, let's try this. The evidence says this really works for people. <laughs> if you're feeling a little insecure about introducing norms, uh, let's, let's see what, let's see how it works. And you can treat it as a, as a learning experiment, but take it seriously. Like let's, let's stick with it for three months and see how we do. Um, and of course we do want to also modify norms. We can return to them and, um, review, you know, how well we're doing relative to our norms, but we can also identify norms that aren't serving the team well and change them and decide together to do that. So in summary, the, the, uh, the various, uh, enabling structures that we want to put in place Certainly at the launch of our team, but anytime our interdependent roles, real teamwork, and norms of conduct. So this gets you sort of to the three essential conditions, but I'm going to make one uh, more point here for you all. Uh, and again, you can reflect if A, you have these on your team, or B, if you're launching your team, we're going to talk a little bit about how to put them into place, no matter, you know, where, what stage you're at. So. Um, this slide demonstrates a sample launch agenda, the types of things that might go into this launch agenda. And if you're already a team, you can also relaunch your team. So I want you to think about this as a sample team relaunch agenda around the places you may need to shore up a little bit of how you're doing together. So one is around, you know, connecting people to why it matters and your stories. Another is the purpose that we discussed and setting the aim around that. Another is understanding people's resources and skills and setting those clear roles making those norms, uh, you know, clear, uh, learning from past efforts and developing some interdependence um, around, you know, how we're going to actually dig in together to get, get some of this work done and, you know, strategic work around what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Uh, and then, of course, clarifying who will do what by when. So um, these principles, uh, you know, the best possible time to put these conditions in place are right at the very beginning of a team. Teams themselves, every team, even if four people, is a complex system. And complex systems are influenced and shaped by the initial conditions that are put in place in those systems. So it is much easier to deal with any problems that arise if you've built a sturdy platform at the start, and it's much more difficult to reverse a group's directory, trajectory. But that's, that's why, you know, you still can, and, and part of it is to reflect as a team, sort of on earth, we can, you know, we can function more effectively and, and let's spend a little time figuring out how, because even if we take a moment to get that foundation back in place, then sort of the urgency of the work will be, uh, you know, we'll do a more effective job in achieving the aims that we set for ourselves if we can take a little time to do that. So, so that's why we take teams really seriously and we treat them with, with great intentionality and, uh, and we begin with those, those shared values. Um, and I just wanted to again invite Stacy and Shannon to, to comment a little bit about some of the, the key elements, not only at the launch of a team, but also in the staff training for FoodFit. Yeah, so after you've already worked as a team and you've gotten that input from all team members um, in planning out your process, when you think about that final staff training to make sure everyone's feeling, feeling comfortable and on board, there are five key things that flufit.org recommends, including. Um, and the first is information about the importance of both the flu shot and the colorectal cancer screening. So that purpose, you know, why are we doing this, just kind of reiterating that for folks. The second is information on how to work, organize the workflow effectively. Hopefully, this is something that everyone has had some input into, but this is really looking at, you know, when will eligibility be assessed? Who's going to initiate those conversations about the fit kit, 
you know, who's dispensing it, who's doing the patient education. So making sure everyone has um, a shared understanding of what that workflow will look like. Um, the third is assessing eligibility for flu shots and for FIT or IFOB without waiting for a doctor's order. Um, and if you need more kind of like clinical information on, on that eligibility, definitely feel free to reach out to us and we can give some guidance on that. Um, the fourth is talking to patients about the FIT and how to complete the test. So making sure that any of the staff who will be involved in dispensing the kits are really comfortable giving that patient education um, and have all of the materials they need and, and tools and resources they need to do that. And then the fifth is information on how to record their work and provide follow-up of the kits that are provided to patients. So making sure um, anyone who's dispensing a kit knows what the tracking system is, how to document, um, and then who's responsible after a kit has been dispersed for following up with that patient um, for any reminder systems. Great, thank you. So again, you can check this out here at this website and also you can directly follow up um, via email with either Stacy or Shannon. We'd be happy to support and, and coach you through it. Um, so we're, we're at the hour. I'm so embarrassed that we didn't get to Q&A. So guys, please, please, if you have any questions, chat them in and we will, we will find you and answer your questions. Um, and you can, of course, uh, again, you know, email them to Stacey and Shannon, and, and if there are any for me directly, they can also forward them to me, and I'm happy to respond, um, and to Christina as well. So uh, we, we definitely want to honor our norm of getting you out of here on time. Um, I want to thank everybody for their time with me. I want to thank Stacey and, and Shannon and, uh, and colleagues, again, for inviting me to participate with all of you. I'm really excited for the, you know, the work you have ahead of you, and uh, this is really, really important. Um, for all of us in our communities and in our families, and um, it's uh, heroic to be taking it forward. So thanks for all that you do. And, uh, and again, a big hello to some of my alumni. And hey, folks, if you aren't alumni and would like to be and learn more about these kind of things, I'm just going to leave this slide up too. Um, you can join this course uh, that, that teaches you this skill and many, many others about how to lead change uh, and do sort of the, the human side of bringing people together in improvement work. Um, and, and what it takes to actually equip one another to, to engage and, uh, you know, develop will, buy-in, and execution on, on the work you're doing. Um, so we're really happy to invite you to join us next January through June. We'll be offering this, um, this program again. It's online. So all you need is, is what you've got right now and, um, and a little time and a project like the one you're looking at uh, to, to practice it in. Um, and of course, you can you can ask your colleagues about it as well. So if you'd like any more information, I have my colleague Risa Hayes at the National Coordinating Center for the Quality Improvement Network. And no matter what organization you're from, if you're working with a quality improvement network like the Great Plains, um, you certainly can um, uh, participate in the course alongside uh, your quality improvement network leaders. So thanks, you guys. And uh, again, I'll turn it back now to you and uh, to Shannon, Stacy. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kate, and Christina, too. Really great information. We will send all the participants um, today the webinar recording, as well as slides with an evaluation. And we also want to encourage you to register for the last webinar in the series, which is August 3rd, called Navigating Through Flu Fit. Um, if you have any questions or are needing any support along the way, please don't hesitate to reach out to us today. Thanks again for joining, and have a great day. Thank you, guys.